Hi, this is Lara Bryden. For many women, the years leading up to the final period can be a time of neurological symptoms, including higher perceived stress, anxiety, brain fog, migraines, and sleep disturbance. To learn more about the underlying mechanisms of neurological change, as well as assessment and treatment strategies, join me on November 15th for a Bioceuticals Clinical Mastery Class. You can book your spot at bioceuticals.com.au. See you there. Welcome to FX Medicine, bringing you the latest in evidence-based, integrative, functional and complementary medicine. I'm Dr. Michelle Woolhouse. FX Medicine acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia, where we live and work, and their connections to land, sea and community. We pay our respects to the Elders, past and present, and extend this respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. One of the most important tenets of practice is to meet a patient where they are at. But in a busy practice, this doesn't always happen as planned. So today, we are going to turn the tables away from the professorial input and researchers and focus our attention on the patient's perspective. Hearing from patients at their most vulnerable times is so important for practitioners to review our own perspectives and to help us see our blind spots. And most importantly, find the humbleness required to honour the whole person. Today, I have a very special guest, Nick Brax. Nick is a mental health advocate, actor, athlete and podcaster who is on a mission to reduce the stigma of mental health and bring it into the conversation of the everyday. We are going to chat about what helped him the most, how community and support helped him find a better way. And we're also going to delve into some of the idiosyncrasies of men's mental health and how it can present differently to women and how we can support boys and men during these vulnerable times. Welcome to the show, Nick. Thank you so much, Michelle. I'm super excited to have this chat with you. So you talk a lot about mental health, especially its impact in men. What happened for you and why has this become such an important topic for you? So there's a, a long story, but, you know, in short, I had issues with anxiety, compulsive thinking and a whole range of things like that from a very young age that I didn't know uh, how to deal with and I didn't really have the knowledge or support around me to deal with that and it manifested into a whole range of issues when I finished at high school and I was off the rails for a long time and it was when I finally made a recovery from that process and started to get my life back on track that I just became so passionate about trying to help other people to get these messages that I did here earlier and I was just seeing firsthand how huge of a you know lack of education was out there and preventative support especially became something I was passionate about. Mm, I know I was recently reading actually about like well often we define anxiety for example as a psychological issue but in many ways it's a thinking error like sometimes we think incorrectly and that's why we get this anxiety and and so rather than kind of putting it into a disease basket you know, if we can think it, about it differently, it can radically change the trajectory of the experience for people. There's a lot of support popping up with a particular focus on mental health, which is really great and overdue. You know, I was preparing for this podcast and looking at Men's Line, which is a fantastic resource. And now Movember are entering this space and training up counsellors to, to really particularly focus on men and there's Tomorrow Man and another one's called Speak Share and all these really kind of grassroots organisations popping up, which is great. And what I like about that is it shines a particular light of how men present because their depression or their anxiety can be masked somewhat by risk-taking or alcohol or drug use or workaholism or anger. What were the ways your mental health issues presented and were you blind to some of them? You mentioned, you know, being off the rails. Can you tell us a little bit about that presentation from a clinical perspective? Yeah, and, and the biggest one for me, similar to some of those you mentioned there, was 
was alcohol and a lot of that risk-taking behaviour. And I guess when I eventually connected the dots, I was able to see that it was always using extreme behaviour to cope. So at a very young age, from sort of the age of 11 till 16 or 17, I was obsessed with originally playing AFL and then became so fit through how hard I trained that I would win the middle distance running races and that became the new obsession. And I was at one point getting up at two or three in the morning, hiding bricks under my bed, training for three hours before school, tripling what my coach gave me to do and just doing a level of training that made no sense, but was just a way for me to feel in control. And and then when that all finished and I was injured and dropped out of university for a period, I discovered alcohol and that became really the coping mechanism. So binge drinking and just using it as pure escapism um, and it, did, it got completely out of control. So it wasn't until that really hit a climax that I started to take very small steps to get the help that I needed, but it was a, it was a long process. Mm, that's so interesting. Like for, for you, high achieving and striving and fitness, which really on the on the outskirts is like, oh, fantastic, go Nick, you know, like really pushing kind mm-hmm. of those barriers, which I think is really interesting because I see that quite a lot in practice is we have these kind of sanctioned ways that we, you know, do life, which is all about striving and being the best. And you certainly was doing that, but in fact, that was kind of part of the mask. Yeah, that was a huge part of the mask and still something I have to manage on a daily basis. And I think yeah. so many of us do really, because we, you know, we live in a society that teaches us that we need to do more, we need to make more money, we need to, you know, strive for the next thing. And social media and technology has, you know, elevated that on a multiple of thousands and it's out of control. And I think unless you can do the work on yourself and really mm. learn how to tap into your own intuition and listen to your gut and really make decisions based on what are healthy for you and what you truly want. You're going to, on some level, be sucked into that. Uh, And for me, it was really elevated from growing up with a well-known father and from the age of 12 till my early 20s, he was the Premier of Victoria. And I guess being known as the son of this person just added Mm. extra fuel to that where I was just out there, yeah, on a mission that, you know, how do I do something so extreme that, I can become known as Nick Brax, not not the son of Steve Brax. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's so interesting the kind of structure we kind of get born into. You mentioned, like, you know, you made these really kind of micro steps, which I think is really important from, you know, just sort of turning a vicious cycle around is these kind of micro steps are almost like they're the smallest, but they're the hardest, but they're the most profound. Like what was those kind of first few steps that you took to really turn the tide? Yeah, and I couldn't agree more that they are the hardest because I think when something's not familiar, it, we look at the bigger picture and get overwhelmed. And so for me, the first, the very first step was just getting professional help. And I had gotten to a point where, like I'd said before, I'd dropped out, I'd deferred from taking a gap year, come back, I'd dropped out of university had stopped working and was just drinking three, four nights a week, sort of obliterating myself and could barely get out of bed. So eventually I couldn't hide it from people anymore. And my mum dragged me to get help. And that was the very first step. And then I started learning, hearing what I was going through and was hearing stories about other people and being told that there was actually, this wasn't, you know, something that was uncommon and there were practical ways to deal with it. And, and it was just really, for me, just taking literally putting one foot in front of the other. So not even Mm. trying to find the best step. It was more about I need to just do something. So I got into another course at university and then it was just about, okay, I need to turn up for the first day. I need to now get through this first day. And then Mm. just literally doing it in that way. Uh, And, you know, it's hard not to, like I was saying, sort of in anything in life, we're trying to, you know, start exercising often we won't stick to it because we're thinking too far ahead rather than looking at how do I just make that daily habit. So that's, you know, one of the biggest parts of the work I do is talking about creating habits and routines and all that sort of thing. But it was really difficult for me at the time, but taking those micro steps started to compound and started to get momentum and it built on itself and just taught me, you know, the most important life lesson that I've ever learned. Mm. Which is? 
Well, which Can is you put it which in? is just <laughs> taking that first step. Yeah, uh, if I yeah, yeah. If I try and summarize that, I'd say, I'd say it's about just forgetting about outcomes, forgetting about everything else, and just focusing on the process and just putting one foot in front of the other. So really, just breaking things down into okay, what what am I going to do today? How can I actually create this? new habit how can I stick to whatever this new behavior is and and just drilling it down and and not thinking too far ahead and I get I think for me it's been the most important lesson because mm. my mind automatically thinks too, too far ahead and I yeah. want to do a million things at once and want to take over the world and it was the only way I could sort of find a blueprint that would work for me otherwise you know yeah. things sort of got out, out of control. Oh, I think that's just so profound. I, I have to just, you know, call it out because even I'm a bit like you, you know, I want to do <laughs> a million things at once. But I want to kind of call out actually how profound that is for somebody who is a striver and who, you know, has that internal mechanism or did have that internal mechanism for for so much internal pressure about really bringing that back to those kind of micro steps and really focusing on that day by day Processes. It really is a profound message that you're sharing. I wanted to to talk a little bit about the cultural narrative, you know, is is starting to be discussed for boys and for teens and adolescents and, and young men and, and older men, you know, and there's this cultural narrative that boys don't cry, you know, toughen up, stop being a wuss. And, and certainly we've been challenging that over the last couple of decades. But it's still very much prevalent in, in the schoolyard, in the sports clubs and even in the homes, you know, and the workplaces. So despite some of this great work being done in this space, how big a problem do you think this is and do you see the conversations changing? Yeah, I think it's still a gigantic problem and I think especially like you're talking about when it comes to men, I think it is fantastic that there's much more of a conversation about it and that's progressed over the last five, ten years. COVID's made it more talked about than ever and there couldn't be more awareness, which is great. But I think when you really drill down, there are still severe problems and, you know, you see it every day. I see it in schools when I talk to schools. Uh, we're doing a lot of work with my company in the construction industry that's male dominated and mm. it's horrific. You know, I could tell you countless stories that I've heard in there that are just shocking and I can't remember the exact statistic, but it's something like they're six times more likely to die from suicide than yeah, an accident I've at work that. and shocking mental health problems. And it really comes back to what I said at the beginning, I think, that there's a lot of awareness, but there's not enough proper preventative support to mm. really help people. And I think that that's a societal issue and governments need to do more. And I think we like to put a Band-Aid on things and we need to put a Band-Aid on things. But I think we also need to really take more steps backwards and look at, okay, how do we actually get to the core of this? How do we do things that aren't going to pay off right now, but, but are going to actually equip people with the skills to, in the future, make better decisions and, you know, make it more sustainable that way. And so I think there's a long way to go. With this research that I was looking at, they were really focusing on what is the trigger for men to get help? And I noticed when you were talking, it was like, my mum took me to this appointment kind of thing. And it's often the women in men's lives that that tend to kind of push them into, I know in, in my general practice, it was like, yeah, well, I don't know why I'm here. My wife made the appointment for me. Or, I mean, I've heard that and I'm sure loads of practitioners listening have heard that same thing. In your opinion and, and the work that you do in speaking on the ground, like, how do we get men to seek the help that they need, even at a preventative level, even if they're feeling slightly anxious or increased pressure or have you got any ideas there? Yeah, it's a, a really good question and it's such a, a difficult one. I think, you know, you're right there with it'll normally be if they're, you know, pushed from their partner or for me, my mum or, you know, different situations like that. I mean, the main thing I've been doing in this area for over 12 years now is just sharing my story and going and talking to groups of people and sharing other stories. And what I've seen from that is it's pretty obvious and logical, I guess, but people, I think it's the most powerful thing, just being able to have people become more open about sharing stories. And if there's a man who another man can relate to and they're hearing a story and seeing, you know, them dispel an image that they had 
and seeing behind the curtain that this person actually went through all these different things and they've been through a similar thing, it automatically gives them permission to, you know, to realize, oh, I'm not alone. There's nothing unique about what I'm going through. This is actually quite normal and maybe it's okay for me to get help as well. So I think mm. storytelling and is incredibly powerful and probably the, the strongest way to do it. But, you know, it's not, not a simple thing to, to change. Yeah, no, I agree with you. I mean, I think our stories can empower us or they can disempower us. And speaking about them certainly helps to kind of reshape them in many ways, particularly when we share. So what is the feedback that you've had from some of your participants that listen to you? I mean, it's been mostly positive feedback. And I mean, I've had a lot of the time I I used to do, I don't do so many now, but I used to do a lot in schools. And the biggest thing that I found was I would go and speak to these schools and it would sort of be hit and miss. You know, sometimes you might have a lot of them asking questions and speaking at the end, sometimes not so many. So it was hard to gauge, okay, how much, you know, impact has this actually had? But almost every time I spoke in schools, and this was to sort of year 10 to 12 students and ones that could relate to my story and I think saw it as something, you know, rather than having an older person come in, you know, I was closer to their age at the time. And Mm. um, almost every time I'd hear back from one of the teachers there that one of the kids had on the back of that gone and, you know, asked for help and made that change and, and that sort of thing. So it sort of really, I guess, reinforced to me the importance of that. And then on the other side in in companies, like I was saying before, there's sort of too many stories to tell, but particularly in construction, the most powerful one I had was we were doing a series of talks for a construction company that had sites all over Australia, these factory settings. And it was a Friday afternoon, I was delivering this this talk and sort of we'd done a whole number of them. And this was one of the final ones. And at the end of it, one of the leaders in that company who everyone actually looked up to and lent on for support and no one would have thought he had any sort of mental health related issues. He came up to myself and the HR manager and revealed that he had a an active plan to end his life on that weekend. And he'd been suffering in silence for 20 plus years. And not that I did anything miraculous. It was more just that he the timing, you know, was right and he heard this message and something clicked and he spoke about it and then as he was talking about it and the HR person, you know, spoke to him and helped him get the help, he realised very quickly, you know, how crazy the thought was and was able to, you know, get rehabilitated and it just, I guess a lot of that just highlighted that we, I think it's about in society, it's, you know, we need to try and become more open and honest and we're conditioned to do the opposite more than ever. Oh, absolutely. And I've got goosebumps listening to that story because I just, uh, when I listen to that, I just think, God, human beings are just so beautiful. Like when we really can, you know, speak honestly and truthfully and it just builds trust and integrity. And I think, you know, sometimes practitioners as well, like, I mean, the practitioners listening to that, the power of, of sharing our stories and also listening deeply is such a profound gift that I think that we forget, you know, when when we've got somebody sitting in front of us. How can a practitioner help to break down some of that stigma? When you've sort of, you know, when you've got somebody that's a bit resistant, like that guy you you were talking about, you know, like he was a good masker, he was a great actor, he'd, he'd kind of almost fooled himself and fooled everyone else. But if you could put yourself in the shoes, given what you know, like... If he saw a practitioner, you know, a couple of weeks before, how could they break down that mask? I mean, I think it just comes down to trying to really connect with the person and, Mm. you know, regardless of whether it's in that setting as a practitioner or, you know, as a friend meeting, as a coffee, I think whatever it is, it's, you know, people just want to be talked to as a normal human being and be, you know, be heard and be listened to. And I think just trying to provide that environment where they feel comfortable, they're not pushed to to have to reveal anything, more just trying to just find ways to connect and show them that, you know, you're really actually hearing them and that you're on that level and treating people like a human. And And I guess it's sort of, again, in those settings, especially in these factory settings where I've been in ones with people that have been there for 30 plus years and you know, I would walk in and they're looking at me thinking, who the hell does this kid think he is for telling us about mental health? You know, we know what mm. proper suffering is. And, you know, you almost 
terrified and intimidated like what the hell how's this going to go and I'd always try and be self-deprecating and find some sort of way to you know meet them on their level and cut through and then as soon as that happened then they really opened up and they would come and chat to me after and hang out and that's what I found you know how can you just meet someone where they're at and try and really take the time to you know observe them and listen to what they're actually going through or you know Mm. where they're at in life and approach it in that way. And I think back to my own observations of treating men over, you know, the last 25 years or so, is they actually require a lot of time because they'll often come to a practitioner and they're, you know, they're masked up, you know, they're used to having the bravado and Mm. they're used to having not really talking about their emotions as much or or not even knowing that they're um, something worthy of talking about. But then with the beauty of time, and as you kind of mentioned, that kind of connecting where they're at and having, I guess, not so much the courage, but the willingness to actually ask them directly about it, all of a sudden, you've got this incredible, almost human heart on a platter. Like I find it very easy for men sometimes to open up given enough Mm. space And that spaciousness that you talk about, like through sharing stories and a bit slower time as well, really helps, I think, in the clinical space too. Yeah, absolutely. And I think um, it's also what I see as, you know, a problem with society where everything is so fast. There's just not enough time in the day to do everything. And a lot of people want to get the help and then they'll try and make the time and they you know, might not have enough money to commit to it, or they might try and see a psychologist and not connect. And then, you know, they have to go through the process all over again. And even within that, everything's so fast paced that it can be really difficult. So I think that's one of the big problems. It's just not having the space and time in in everything that comes with day-to-day life to, you know, be able to, in a very calm, measured way, deal with these, take the necessary steps. Because like you're saying, it's not it's not ticking a box. It's it's a lifelong process. And, you know, we can't do that if we're not having the gentleness and space to, to do it. And I think too, for men, often with, you know, mental health, for example, they'll often feel like if they open the box, they're going to unravel. It's like if we share it, it becomes like a raging river. And so that's the other important reason for, for mm. this incredible timing that is required in your experience in that early days when you when your mum made that first appointment, you know, that critical kind of moment, did you have some times where you didn't connect with practitioners or, you know, that you kind of got really resistant and pulled back and was there times where you felt like you went backwards and um, what happened? Oh, yeah, for sure, multiple times where I went backwards and, I mean, I think I've probably seen you know, more psychologists than, than I can count. I, I can't even remember how many it would be, but there were so many that I was going through and I was incredibly shy at the time and found it really difficult to open up. And even after going through this huge period of time where it was clear there was a severe problem, I still felt a lot of shame and embarrassment that as a man, I was going through these issues. and And it took me a while to feel okay with that and to build my self-esteem and and confidence back up and find who I was. But I, I guess on reflection, it was definitely an up and down process and something that probably couldn't have moved any quicker. But if I could go back now, it would be probably approaching it in a similar way, but reminding myself that it is, again, going back to what I said earlier, just taking that one step at a time. And mm. like anything in life, if we're trying to learn a new skill or we've got a new job or whatever we're doing, it's going to be up and down. There's going to be, you know, sometimes taking that step backwards to move a few more steps forwards and that whole process. And I think it's it's just really having people understand it, that we're afraid of things we don't know and that we haven't done before. And that goes for anything. And a lot of men haven't been taught to express themselves, to show emotion, to talk about that. And they've been taught that that's something that makes them less of a man. And it's not until you sort of approach that fear that you realise how crazy that that concept is. So it was just really taking those steps and giving it time. Yeah, and it's not just for the men too. I think it's a really good message for women because the other kind of side of that is that women often 
feel uncomfortable when men express their emotions sometimes too. So, you know, we talk about that kind of almost emotional muscle. Like women have to kind of exercise that spaciousness to really listen to men's emotions as well. And I think that's a really profound kind of shift of like having that emotional muscle and building it. Like we never go to the gym the first time we sign up to the gym membership and expect to be able to bench press 60 kilos. I don't even know if that's reasonable, but, you know, like we start off and we know that our bicep curls, we're going to be on the five kilo weights and then six and then seven. So we build slowly. We, we know that. But from mindset, it's so difficult because we give up, not necessarily so easily, but the setbacks feel so difficult. Yeah, no, I love that point you're, you're making there. And I think people give up not because they're not motivated, but because mm. it's not tangible, a lot of this. And yeah. when it comes to creating that mindset, we need a blueprint. So if it was exercise, we sort of know that, okay, well, if I do something physical, if I improve my diet, if I get up and I go to the gym or go for a run or go for a walk, it's going to likely equal a tangible result where I can see myself, you know, shredding weight or whatever you're trying to do. And yeah. and you also sort of know that if I do all of those things and just stop, I'm probably not going to be able to maintain the same, you know, results that I got from doing it. But when it comes yeah. to this side of things, people don't know where to begin. So it's overwhelming. What do I do? It's all intangible. What do I actually do on a daily basis? So I'm sort of mm. I'm a big believer in let's break it down and let's look at what you actually can do and let's list those things. And then out of those things, let's then break it down further to what are the most important things that you actually want to work on right now. And then of those, let's break it down to just one thing. And, you know, even if there are more than that, let's just focus on that for now Mm, and let's do it for a daily until it becomes a habit and something that becomes automatic. And then from there, you'll almost organically fall into the process of you know, doing the next thing and it'll compound on each other. And, you know, I think it's just so critical that people have that that guidance to, you know, make those sort of steps. Yeah, it's a real coaching kind of mindset as well, which I think practitioners can, you know, back 20 years ago, it was was often about seeing a patient and helping them and fixing them and and then they they go. Whereas these days, a lot more kind of coaching, particularly because mental health is so real Mm -hmm. and and giving them that blueprint because we don't see the mental changes, but I often teach people how to see it in their lives. Like, are they laughing more? Have they got more energy? Are their relationships better? You know, are they happier? You know, really subtle ways in which you can create very subtle measurements. It's like, oh, right. Yeah, I did actually laugh at that. Or I did enjoy that catch up with that friend. So we're sort of always auditing our mental health in some ways, particularly if you're coming from a low base, if you're, you know, suffering or particularly stressed or struggling. Absolutely. I love those examples. So lifestyle medicine was foundational for you. I mean, you already had the fitness thing going. I think, you know, when somebody's kind of got that high achieving fitness, you would have had to kind of taper that back to a much more sustainable and I guess healthy kind of goal. But what about things like the body-mind? Like how important was things like dietary change and looking after other aspects of health, sleep? Obviously alcohol was a big issue and there might have been other risk-taking things as well. Like what changes did you make with that and were there issues of motivation with regards to that? Yeah, absolutely. And I think, again, it's sort of, a never-ending process and something that I'm still learning how to constantly evaluate things that are happening in my life and improve them. At the beginning, it was, I mean, for probably my whole life, exercise has been probably the biggest part of my life. And Mm. um, that was the first thing that I really incorporated when I was working through it. It was just getting back into daily exercise. And, you know, I think it's profound how much it helped me and helped so many people. So that was the biggest. I, I was still actually even as I was recovering and getting things back on track, still was drinking and going out and partying and doing those things for quite a while. So I think it took me a little while until I got other things happening and found my feet again to sort of taper that down. And for me, it was really about finding what I was actually passionate about doing once I got clear enough. And and that ended up being the mental health work organically after being on a reality television show, getting asked to share my story and 
been lucky enough to be asked to go and speak in the media and in schools and all that sort of thing. And that gave me the guidance to then take the next step and start, I guess, looking after myself more. And in more recent times, it's been quitting drinking completely and and then, you know, really monitoring things and looking at, okay, actually, my sleeping patterns are all over the place and observing my mood on a given day and realizing, oh, when I, you know, had six hours instead of seven hours sleep, I am more grumpy, I'm more anxious, mm. I'm more agitated. And, and that, that's more come in recent years where it's been, you know, things are moving in the right direction and, you know, on top of a lot of these things, but becoming, I guess, more self-aware and more interested in just really trying to observe these little things that we often don't question, you know, one might just accept that we're angry that day or, you know, we don't yeah, really try and break down, absolutely. hang on, is it because I haven't eaten enough food or haven't had enough sleep or whatever the, whatever's going on? Yeah, it's that beautiful audit scenario of kind of our, our love and, you know, talk about to people to distill, you know, what's going on for them so that they can kind of have a clearer, I guess, avenue to support themselves. So, you know, sleep and stress, but what is the stress? You know, what is creating? Is it thinking patterns? Is it inner critic stuff? Is it relationships, et cetera? So they've got more empowerment in which to kind of deal with what might be going on. With diet, did you do any particular type of diet or did you remove, I mean, we talked about alcohol, but what about things like sugar and caffeine or, you know, did you do any alternative or complementary medicines and did you find them helpful? I didn't actually. I mean, I've always eaten relatively well and I think coming from the background of being an athlete, it was always important to eat a, quite a healthy diet. So for me, it was more about balance where I'll be exercising, eating well, allowing myself still to eat some junk food or have you know days where I can have cheap meals and things like that but as yeah I guess it was just about balance for me and and looking at it more holistically you know am I eating well am I exercising am I keeping balance in my work and having time out and being with friends getting out in nature doing you know keeping that balance because my mind has that tendency to overcompensate and obsess and you know go all in on something at the expense of other areas but as you're saying there, diet, we're learning more than ever the, the link between diet and mental health and um, and gut health and mental health and yeah, it is absolutely. something that can make a huge difference. Yeah, well, the Australian New Zealand College of Psychiatrists updated their first line therapy to be lifestyle medicine, which is quite a profound shift given where it's kind of come from in the last couple of decades or half century or so, which is really exciting. But it sounds for you it's really important to kind of individualise the response because I guess with obsessive people, like if I had have seen you, you know, I would have said, oh, you know, do you exercise? Yeah, you know, I exercise three hours every morning and, you know, I eat a really good diet. You know, you would have been doing quite a lot of those really good things. And so as a practitioner, I might have missed it, you know, in the sense of like really asking you, wow, it sounds like a lot. There's a really obsessional kind of aspect to you that may be creating pressure and stress and anxiety and you know, therefore depression and those kind of things. So for you, that, that word balance is so important because you, you know, you had some very helpful things kind of going on that sometimes we need to get people to exercise and look after their diet and some people we need to do less of, <laughs> which sounds like something that you needed to look at. Yeah, and it's such a good point because, I mean, on so many levels, people, you know, workaholics, like people are, mm. we, we, we praise we that. And we've got, yeah, you know, these, we praise them. Yeah, mm. and I think a lot of the time they're not necessarily aware of, you know, what they're compensating for because they just haven't had the time to do that work on themselves. But it almost always comes to a climax. Either they'll mm. get burnt out or it might be someone, you know, doing a startup and they spend 20 years trying to turn it into a you know, mm. multi-million dollar company. They sell it, they get their payout, and that was meant to be the thing that, made them happy and the goal mm. at the end of the rainbow and and then they end up in a deep depression and um, mm. because they still realise they're the same person. They still have to look themselves in the mirror every day. They still have to deal with yeah. their thoughts and it's not the solution. So, yeah, huge believer in, in finding that balance. Yeah, that's right. Oh, and yeah. relationships as well. Like, I mean, when you have that obsessional kind of mindset too, it's like, yeah, it, it, it impacts relationship because there needs to be some room for that. Like if all the room is for obsessional thinking or striving or perfectionism or 
or more, 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 then there's less room for the slow time, the peacetime, the waxing lyrical, where the creativity and the sort of poetry of life can come through. I wanted to yeah. to ask you, Nick, what your top three pieces of advice are that helped you in your recovery. Like if you could talk to you and that, say, yeah, I reckon they're my top three, what would you say? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, the top three, I would say number one would be just finally admitting that I needed help and becoming open about that. And I remember when I first told my best friend at the time what I had been going through and I hadn't told anyone. I'd only just started seeing the psychologist and I was terrified and you know thought she would never look at me in the same way and um, it was the opposite. So mm. I think just it was such a relief and it then just took this huge weight off my shoulders and allowed me to start taking more steps. So you know, just accepting it, talking about it, being open about it, and then having unconditional relationships around you. So I think as a byproduct of doing that first step, then being able to, whether whether it's your family, one of your best friends, a colleague, whoever it is, trying to, if you don't have it, nurture, how can I find these kind of people that can support me that, and that I can support? And, you know, really having that there as a clutch, because it's so important that we do see a professional, that we do all these different things. But you know, that professional, that might be at most, you know, normally a one hour session a week, if that. So who are you talking to? What are you doing in between? Who's keeping you mm -hmm. accountable? You know, what steps are you, are you taking? So I think having that, and then, like I said at the beginning, just actually taking the steps, putting that one foot in front of the other, creating new habit and just getting momentum through doing that. And by taking the steps, seeing how much of a impact it made. And then, and then that sort of compounding on itself. Yeah, and what I love about listening to your story is like once you did all that, then the passion, you know, it was almost like that real sort of core of essence and inspiration kind of came through you. And I love that fact that, you know, yeah. it's that accountability and those new habits are such an important thing. Okay, so I'm going to give you another yeah. imaginary stage because I know that you're pretty comfy on the stage. <laughs> and I'm going <laughs> yeah. to put together... You know, a thousand naturopaths, a thousand doctors, uh, seven hundred and fifty nutritionists, and a thousand psychologists. I don't know why. <laughs> I don't know why there's less yeah. nutritionists. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to give you the opportunity to tell them from your heart what you need from them. You know, as a sufferer of of depression and anxiety, what would you mm. like to say to them? Yeah, that's a great question. That's a difficult one, but I would say. I mean, first of all, anyone in any of those fields, they're doing invaluable work that is critical. And, you know, I've taken an avenue of advocacy. I'm not a professional. And, you know, I think we absolutely need, you know, as much of that as, as we can. But the one thing I would say within that is, and just from my own personal experience is, you know, how can we try and really listen to the individual that we're talking to and try and help them come out with something practical, even if it's a, you know, a small change that they can actually stick to. Because I think a lot of the time we get given great information, especially seeing psychologists. I found this where I would, you know, talk to them. I would have all of this information that, you know, I understood. I knew where I was, what they're talking about and what I needed to do, but I didn't have an they, there wasn't enough practical steps coming out of it. So I didn't really know how to, what to do after that. Or if I was given information, it was overwhelming and I just couldn't mm. make the time to do it. So how can I, you know, work with you guys to within my, um, you know, my lifestyle and we've all got different capacities and or different willing levels of willingness to, you know, take on new, new initiatives. So within what I'm actually doing, how can we together work out what steps I can actually take that are going to make, you know, some sort of small change uh, in my life. That's, that's the kind of thing I'd be sort of talking to them about. And that's such brilliant advice because it just is in so many different ways. So, Nick, it was such a pleasure to chat to you today and hear about your experience and your mission. And, but also, you know, really most importantly, it was an honour to hear your vulnerability and your honesty and there's so many gems in this discussion in so many ways from 
how you say things and really the gift that you're giving through your story. And as much as poor mental health is a burden, hearing that inspirational tale of recovery and your mission and your habit building and your insights is just so important for all of us. So I hope that you continue to bloom and help so many people. Oh, well, thank you so much, Michelle. And yeah, and same to you. I really appreciate you having me on here and uh, love all of the work you're doing. It's again, yeah, super inspiring. Um, and yeah, really feel very fortunate to be able to come on your show and have this conversation with you so yeah thank you so much for having me thank you everyone for listening today and don't forget that you can find all the show notes transcripts and other resources from today's episode on the fx medicine website we'll also have a link to nick's book mindset i'm dr michelle woolhouse and thanks for joining us we'll see you next time This podcast is intended as healthcare practitioner education only, and it is not a substitute for medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. Make sure you never miss an FX Medicine episode by subscribing to us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. You can also follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook, and Instagram.